Hello and welcome once again to The Bike Show and an episode that sees Don regale us with tales of his long-term hero, Expulse. The fact that it is one of the smallest capacity and most affordable of all models on which to go adventure riding has not stopped our resident horsepower junkie from becoming absolutely smitten with this new bike in his life. He rides the plucky little hero everywhere as part of his daily duties for the bike show, as well as regular adventure rides off into the bush. And I must admit, I am surprised that a man who once told me he can't wait for the first 200 horsepower adventure bike is now so obviously content with only a fraction of that at his disposal. However, talking about the quite ridiculous, seemingly unrealistic prospect of 200 horsepower in an adventure bike. Let us not forget that KTM has already given us 160 horsepower in its 1290 adventure models. And topping even that, we have the 170 horsepower that Ducati brought to the adventure party with its V4 Multistrada. Well, the Italian manufacturer has just released a significantly updated version of that bike and called it the Rally. As the name suggests, its purpose is to take your adventure further, both in terms of distance and the type of terrain it can deal with. If you want to pigeonhole it, then it's Ducati's answer to BMW's mammoth GS adventure. And just as that model supersizes the standard GS, so the Rally does the same to the standard V4 Multi. Alongside that standard model, Ducati already has an S version of the Multistrada with fancier suspension and wheels. And most recently, it added a Pikes Peak model that put wide road racing rims and rubber and lesser travel suspension in the package to create a monstrous Motard-esque dedicated road bike. The Rally now moves the Multistrada's focus to the other end of the spectrum and provides Ducatisti with the most off-road focused of the V4 Multistrada range. To increase range overall, Ducati has bumped up fuel capacity by 8 litres to 30 litres and at the same time the V4 engine, which can be thirsty when worked hard, has now been taught to sip fuel more judiciously when it isn't being worked quite so hard. The Multistrada could already turn off the rear pair of cylinders when at standstill, while waiting at the traffic lights, for example, in order to save fuel and cut down on the generation of excess heat. Well, that ability has now been extended to activate when the bike is in motion and being ridden gently. The suspension has been given some extra travel, now up to 200 millimeters, and that obviously increases ground clearance. The Skyhook semi-active suspension now has an auto-leveling feature, and it also features a minimum preload setting that effectively lowers this tallest yet Multistrada so anyone with a remotely normal inside leg measurement has a hope of getting on and off without suffering an attack of vertigo. A useful feature no doubt and something already offered by Harley-Davidson with its Pan America adventure model. There's a new enduro riding mode that reduces power but provides a more direct throttle response and deactivates wheelie control and rear ABS amongst other parameters to give experienced riders a greater level of control. Lightweight spoke wheels that are an option on other models are standard on the rally. There's an increased level of bash protection around the belly pan area. Rider comfort is improved with a more protective screen and some wider spaced foot pegs. And the pillion gets more room and comfort thanks to a lengthened tail unit. The base price of the Rally will probably be around the 570,000 Rand mark, which is a lot of money. But then I don't think there's any argument either that it's also a lot of bike. Given the success of the GSA in South Africa, you'd have to think demand for Ducati's equivalent model will also be strong. While Ducati has been busy showing off its competition to BMW's dominant model in this segment of the market, BMW has itself been showing off its latest update that just so happens to take it to Ducati's dominant presence in another segment of motorcycling. Think Superbike 
and it's very likely that the image that jumps into your mind's eye will be of a red Panigale, a V4 missile that looks like it will bring home the World Superbike Championship to Ducati this year after what is definitely a far too long absence. BMW is also in that championship and after a difficult couple of years it looks like it might just be in a position to offer a viable challenge for the title in 2023. To help it in that endeavour the German manufacturer has just unveiled a new and significantly updated S1000RR for 2023. Before we get too carried away with the technological details of this latest version of the double R, let's take a moment to appreciate wings, <laughs> proper wings, in that they are obviously designed from the get-go to be a part of the fairing, rather than being a, a bolt-on kind of afterthought. I know the limited edition M1000 double R had wings, but not like this, where they are so beautifully incorporated into the body of the bike. Yes, I do feel a bit like a child staring at a poster of a 1970s Lamborghini Countach that had a massive and probably quite unnecessary wing on it, but so what? My inner kid thinks wings on a bike are even more cool. And in a game of top trumps, it's about time because the competition from Italy and even conservative leaning Japan has had wings on their superbikes for a while now. But this being the 21st century, these visual markers actually do something useful. And in this case, it's to provide extra downforce that helps control power wheelies. Maybe that makes it easier for the electronic wheelie control to do its job. And there's apparently benefits for stability under braking as well. Obviously, being an aerodynamic feature, the greater the speed of the bike, the greater the downforce effect that's produced by the wings. At road legal speeds, they're largely irrelevant, but get yourself to a track, to a fast track, and their effect will become much more important. Other surface refinements include a uh, taller screen and a subtly redesigned rear end, but as usual, it's under the skin of the bike where the major updates are to be found. Let's start with the relatively minor fiddling that's been done to the inline four-cylinder shift cam engine on the back of tweaks that have been made to the M model. The result is peak horsepower climbing by a couple, so now it's up to 207 horsepower. Of more interest than the modest mechanical updates are the improvements to the s 1000 rs electronics, and specifically the refined riding modes permitted by the addition of a steering angle sensor. That means the traction control system now gets a slide control element that permits the bike's brain to dial in a degree of drift before employing the TC to bring everything back in line again. Two levels of drift are available and I have to say I'm glad it's Donovan who does most of the superbike track testing these days because to get a feel for how that works is going to take some serious pace, effort and, well, not a little bravery. And of course, trust that BMW has got its calculus absolutely spot on. While Don's drifting the bike on the power, he might as well do the same on the brakes because that same steering angle sensor is incorporated into the brake slide control feature that does the same thing, basically, allowing the rear end to step out before chiming in through the ABS system to bring it all back into line again. Oh, and for track day warriors, there's a new slick setting so that the bike knows you're using a serious set of race tires. On the chassis front, there's also been plenty of changes, beginning with holes. BMW has put more of them in the frame in order to introduce some flex into the package, which in turn will apparently enhance feel. The chassis geometry has also been changed, so everything from steering head angle, trail, triple clamp offset, and the wheelbase itself of new dimensions in an effort to increase feel at the track. And BMW has also engineered in a, uh, a greater level of adjustability to the chassis. This is all stuff that will be of interest to the racers out there. If you get this bike for the road and feel the need to adjust these parameters for your Sunday morning blast, then, well, you should probably seek some kind of counselling. Of more interest to you will be the smoother two-way quick shifter operation and the fact that it's quicker and easier than ever to swap between road and race shift patterns. For those that don't know, uh, that means for the road, as you know, 
your gear changes one down and then five up. Well, it's simply the other way around for the track. The reason for that, you might reasonably ask, well, mainly to allow for easier up changes on the way out of a corner. Imagine you breaking hard and late into the apex of a corner. All the down changes are done long before you get to the apex where you are then at maximum lean. And on modern sport bikes, that maximum lean angle is well, it's huge, quite possibly over 60 degrees. You're on the throttle earlier and harder than ever these days as well, thanks to amazing tyre technology and electronics. And so in a lot of longer corners, you need to start going up through the gears before you've pick the bike up from that lean angle and with a road change you would need to get your foot under the gear lever to push it up well because the bike is leant over so far there simply isn't the room to get your foot in there so it makes more sense to have your foot pressed down on the lever from above where there is some space anyway back to the s1000 rr that has had some quite significant work done to it not the least of which is a dedicated GoPro tail mount available as an option. So you can film the back of your leathers on the breakfast run, obviously. Inevitably, all these improvements mean an increase in price and going by prices as they will be in the rest of the world, you could well be looking at something in the region of 325, 330,000 Rand, which actually doesn't seem so bad when you realize it could be a quarter of a million Rand cheaper than the Ducati Multistrada Rally that we just took a look at. Two big new models then from two of motorcycling's most important manufacturers featuring the latest greatest technology you can find on a motorbike. Just as a counterpoint to that if you hanker after more simple times when bikes were not so electronically assisted take a look at this a rare bike that someone sent me a link to and I have to say I'd very much like one in my own office. Yes I'd even like to build it myself though I think it's Fair to say I wouldn't do quite as good a job as this gentleman who has also made a brilliant little pit area for this extraordinary six cylinder 250cc Honda RC166. The Easy Modeler's Room is the YouTube channel of a Japanese model maker and if you like this sort of thing may I suggest you head over to his channel, do the guy a favour and add yourself to his pitifully small subscription base and support his strangely therapeutic model building endeavors. Right, time for an ad break and then news from Fired Up and Hero.